Good late morning. Uh, my name is uh, Dre Taylor, founder of M2M Community Foundation, now Valley Aquaponics 100,000 pound food project in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, located in the urban core. I have a mentoring program uh, called Males to Men. So I have about 50 boys I mentor every Monday and Wednesday, six to eight. Uh, we have a program every Saturday and Sunday. They'll start this uh, end of April where they work at the city market. So it's called Veggie Valet. And so they walk around the city market and they help people with their groceries every Saturday and Sunday. That way for them to earn an income. And so what we teach them is how to talk to people, speak up, uh, and that's like their first job. And so this is things we do with our boys, uh, with our males and men program. This is us at a fishing event where we caught some small fish. Like it's the first time that we always went fishing. Uh, some of the things we do, teach them how to change tires, how to uh, check uh, air fluids on cars. We have a partnership with the Black Pilot Association. So we take about 35, 40 kids every year to fly in private planes owned by black pilots around Kansas City. And so they fly over the whole metro area. Uh, we even sent a couple to Oshkosh, Wisconsin to actually learn how to fly uh, for a week long class. And so these are some of the things we do. Uh, on a yearly basis with our boys and try to teach them to be, you know, young men. Our mission is to raise strong, conscious, productive young men and reestablish accountable and productive leadership in the community. So what is aquaponics? Aquaponics is a system of aquaculture, which the waste produced by farm fish or other aquatic animals supplies nutrients for plant grown hydroponically, which in turn purify the water. And so back in 2014, uh, me and my boys uh, started our first aquaponics system in the basement of an old elementary school that I attended, and that's where I, we mentor with the boys. And so this was the first time the boys got to uh, use power tools, uh, use a tape measure, and learn about growing food in a basement here at uh, what's called the Mary Kelly Center. So we was building a the system there. It was a small four by eight system. It was in the basement, a moldy old basement. Uh, we used to bring funders down. Catherine was one of the first funders who funded us. Uh, in this moldy basement to come down and see what we was doing at the Mary Kelly Center. Uh, this was the vegetables first starting, starting out, and then that was maybe like two months later. And so we bring funders down there to talk about, you know, growing food, uh, how we wanted to get a greenhouse and, and expand the operation. And so we would show people how aquaponics worked, and I was always amused by the fish and the vegetables, and they couldn't believe you can do it on a much small scale and produce the kind of quality vegetables that we produce. And that was some, that was some of the first, uh, like, kale or broccoli, spinach that the boys ever tasted before, and you'd ask them how it tasted, and they would lie and say it was good, which I knew it wasn't. You know, <laughs> without any salad dressing, but you know, it was something that they put in the ground or put in the rocks and was able to grow. Uh, this was the lot that we started on right on 29th and Wild Bash. So it was a vacant lot uh, right in the urban core, uh, right in the heart of the city, a lot of crime. They had a, a Showtime special actually three blocks away from this facility here uh, called uh, 27th and Prospect. And it was a lot of, a lot of drug uh, addiction, prostitution. I mean, we still see uh, some of that around the area to this day. I mean, I found a drug needle on a property. I used to back in this area right here and do drugs because it was a little little driveway uh, that started. Uh, one one slide that I see that I missed that wasn't on here, uh, how I got started back in 2011, uh, I, my uncle introduced me to aquaponics, and so I was researching it on YouTube, finding things out, and then all of a sudden a guy named Will Allen came to Kansas City and did a workshop. Those who are not familiar with Will Allen, one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people because he grows a million pounds less than three acres. And so we came to Kansas City, did a workshop. My grandfather and my uncle all attended this workshop. We built our small little aquaponic system at the workshop. We all went home. We built our own individual systems. Uh, my, father, my grandfather ended up killing his fish, you know, but uh, <laughs> he was hard headed. He didn't understand the ratio of uh, plants to fish. But, uh, uh, we all built the only aquaponics system, so that's how we uh, actually got started in aquaponics back in 2011. This was a site, uh, you see it was 18 trees on a property. Uh, we cut down 18 trees, the city cut down 18 trees for us. We repurposed five of those trees, we had oak and we had walnut, and so we had slabs made out of them, and so we're utilizing that for benches and tables. One of them is at my uh, office across the street, so we purchased a house uh, across the street from the greenhouse. 
And so we're using that now as a community space, office, and we look to get a commercial kitchen inside there to take our food that we're growing and show the boys how to cook and distribute with demonstrations and cooking classes inside of that house. And so we talk about community development. This is what we're trying to do in the community uh, directly across the street. Uh, we also, uh, these lots was donated from the guy that we bought the house from. And so it was a daycare for 50 years. And so uh, they retired the daycare and he had like 60 something thousand dollars in, in liens against the property. And so we was able to, to get those liens removed for him and we purchased that property. So we talk about community development, what we're doing here, you know, we're making an impact in the community. This is us the first day digging. Uh, we have, this is our fish tanks actually that we're digging. I have three fish tanks, six feet deep, four foot wide, two of them 120 feet long. So I got two 20,000 gallon fish tanks and I got one 10,000 gallon fish tank. And so the neighbors thought we was crazy when we was digging six feet deep. Like, what are you doing over here in the city digging six feet deep? We guarantee you we wasn't doing any graves or anything like that. But uh, <clears throat> I was just uh, getting started. And so this is like, it was like our first day. Uh, and we just, been, we just been lucky and blessed for all the opportunities that came our way. Uh, we had a guy that's supposed to dig these holes for us for six months. He said, we're going to dig them, we're going to dig them. Then the day before, he said he needed some money, and when he said it was free before. And so, uh, you know, I was at the Black Pilot Association. One of the guys said, I have some equipment. I'll come out there on a Wednesday. He looked at and surveyed, surveyed, uh, surveyed the land. And then after that, uh, the next day, he dug these holes for us for free. Uh, he broke his bucket. He broke the lines on his thing digging. Uh, everything. It was used to be houses on this on this property, and the houses that was here, uh, they used to bury them down in the ground. And so that's before they start removing the houses from the vacant lots. And so we was pulling everything up from refrigerators, stoves. Uh, I mean, everything you could think of: bottles, clothes, all kind of stuff in this property. We did get a Brown Brownsfield Initiative grant to do a survey on the property. But uh, everything came out good. It wasn't anything contaminated inside the soil, but we did have all those remnants of uh, people living on the property. This is the idea of the tanks that we have here. It's like I said, about six feet deep, four foot wide. And so this is us digging uh, leftover. So uh, we had to widen it out. So it was a lot of hand digging. Even though we had that machine there, it was hand digging for at least two or three weeks, digging at, digging at them holes in there for the fish tanks. <clears throat> These are my boys uh, out there working. I got the construction hats. Home Depot donated some, some hats and some tape measures. And so they was out shoveling the dirt. Uh, it wasn't going anywhere. It was more work with low productivity. <laughs> it was a lot of low productivity. It was moving from one pile to the next pile. And so, but this was something that they can say that they did, they helped build as part of. And so usually in a community, when you see projects like this, they don't see people looking like them creating something. And so it's important to give them uh, an imagery to say, I was part of this and I built this. And they can always come back and say, I helped build and design this greenhouse here. Uh, this was looks after we, we uh, dug the holes. And like I said, I'm not a contractor, I'm not a, <laughs> An architect or anything like that. So we just, every, it wasn't no blueprint. It wasn't, it, it, this was not a blueprint. And you can kind of tell when you start to look at some pictures that you can tell it wasn't a blueprint. This was our first greenhouse. Uh, first, I wanted to get a 20 by 70 foot greenhouse. And then I said, you know what, let me go with 30 by 90, a little bit bigger. I got on Craigslist, I seen one for 30 by 150 feet. So I said, why not? Let's do 30 by 150. Uh, <laughs> So we got the greenhouse on Craigslist, and so I had somebody dismantle the greenhouse, but the smart thing to do would have somebody who dismantled it, put it back together, which we didn't think that far ahead. And so we looked at these parts for maybe three or four days, trying to figure out what a purlin is, you know, with all these different kind of parts of this greenhouse. And so we finally figured how to put it together. An interesting fact is this whole greenhouse and this whole project was basically built on volunteers. And so we had a lot of volunteers come and help out of this project. I mean, we probably had over a thousand volunteers to come and, and help out with this project. There was a, uh, a guy lived across the street uh, the first day we started building. And the first day we started building, he came out and uh, he helped build. And his friends, they would sit on the porch with were saying, why are you helping out? They're not paying you anything like this and that. And so they were just on the porch drinking. So he would come every day. And he said that this took his mind off his mother passing, who passed like a week earlier. And so it gave him something to do in the process. And so while they were sitting there talking like, oh, they're not paying you this and that, uh, he was able to eventually get a car from grant funding. And so uh, those guys who were talking stuff was in the backseat riding to the store 
with him, you know, instead of walking and begging for rides. And so when you talk about economic development, this, uh, this is a perfect example of economic development. I think we had a question right here. Oh, uh, that's another thing. Uh, uh, I talked to Catherine about it, so I got to refer to Catherine, but uh, she said she worked with the city a couple of times, and I was telling them about the project, and uh, they was telling me all this stuff, and so we just built it. You know, we, <laughs> we, but it was better to ask for forgiveness than permission sometimes. Yeah, they looked the other way because, I mean, we was doing all kind of crazy stuff, building that. If you see right in the middle there, there's some wood between the two fish tanks. We got a ladder in between that. So OSHA would have shut us down if they seen what we were kind of doing out there. But uh, nobody got injured or died during this building, this greenhouse. So I wouldn't advise you doing anything without a permit. So we had a lot of wood that we put inside the greenhouse here. We probably have about $30,000, $40,000 worth of wood inside. Like I said, it's a 30 by 150 foot greenhouse. And so uh, what I didn't account for was when I went from a 30 to 90 to 30 to 150 feet, there was going to be more materials involved in that. And so I didn't calculate those materials in this. And so the project kind of stalled a little bit trying to get funding. And sometimes you just got to build it because when you say you're going to build a greenhouse and aquaponics, people look at you crazy. Uh, what are you talking about? Where are you going to do it? And so uh, you just have to keep building and let people see the vision and go from there. Uh, <clears throat> all this wood set on a corner. Uh, we got a fence now, but the fence is more, more for liability issues because we have water and fish. Uh, but, but all this wood set on a corner uh, for about two or three weeks' time without nobody stealing one board. We talk about thirty dollars or $40,000 worth of high-grade high material wood sitting there, and not one board was stolen in an area where crime happens all the time. I mean, you hear gunshots at least every two or three days in the, in the area we're in, but that speaks volumes to the community we built around a greenhouse where not one board was stolen. And I don't care if in the suburbs or inner city, somebody's going to build a deck out of that wood if they see it sitting there. <laughs> So this was some of the walls that we built uh, for the fish tanks that we had inside of there. Uh, it looked from an overall view uh, from the greenhouse we had covered. And so right now it's, uh, we're looking to redo the greenhouse as it currently sits. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit, little bit more. Uh, we have school groups that come out, tours. Uh, we probably have at least two or three different school groups that come every year to volunteer. Uh, at the project, they learn how to transplant, do a lot of stuff that there's our community garden outside of our fence. So we have a community garden about half the block. So it's about four foot wide, uh, length of the greenhouse, so 150 feet long. And so that's all free for people in the community to come get whenever they want to get. And so we're right off the main bus line in Kansas City, like one block off the main bus line, which is Prospect. And so it's a heavily trafficked uh, uh, street. And so people get off the bus with grocery sacks and they come and be able to get their kale, their, their tomatoes, peppers, and all the stuff that we're growing out there. And that's free and we help, help plant that for the people in the community. Yeah, we are Four Seasons. So this is the first season that we actually have fish inside of our greenhouse, uh, power issues, and then we had a partnership that didn't go too well, and so that kind of stalled us out a little bit, but uh, we got everything uh, uh, taken care of, and so uh, this is like our first full season with our fish inside of our system. So these are just kids from the neighborhood that came out and helped plant, uh, you know, and sometimes this is the first time they get to, to plant and put their hands in the dirt. Uh, we had one lady that lived across the street it was our first time eating like an eggplant. You know, she was like 70 years old, so she never ate an eggplant before. And so just the education piece where kids know that, you know, uh, pickles come from cucumbers. They don't know that. And so to see them grow and understand you know, that's where they come from, it's a whole educational component that we're doing here with the Nile Valley Aquaponics. <clears throat> we talk about community here. Uh, it's the lady on the left here. And so every Saturday we have volunteers, we probably average around 15 to 25 volunteers every Saturday to come out and volunteer at the greenhouse. We don't really promote too much, they just show up. And uh, you know, that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing trying to manage all those volunteers, but uh, they show up. So the lady on the left name is Miss Maxine. Miss Maxine, I, I met her uh, doing uh, volunteering at a political, uh, at the polling stations. 
And so she would be there. She's a mean old lady. She was always on people about staying 25 feet from the door. And she always roll around in that wheelchair and she go right back in. I'm like, that's a mean old lady. And so uh, about three or four years, we developed a relationship because I was working at the same polling stations. And uh, one day I seen her driving down the street uh, by the greenhouse. She asked if I had any green tomatoes. And I said, yes. And so I gave her some green tomatoes. She made like a, a tomato relish out of them and uh, <laughs> succotash or something she was making. And uh, she said, you know, I'll wake some wine. And I'm like, oh, I don't know about this wine. And so uh, she said, try some of this wine. And so she made this wine. This wine is called Bitches Brew. And so uh, for those, those who don't know Bitches Brew, it's an old Miles Davis song. It's like 14 minutes long. It's, it's too long for me to listen to, but it's like 14 minutes long. And that's what she named the wine after. So every, every Saturday, uh, she comes to the greenhouse when the weather is good and she sells like a case of wine every Saturday. When we had our, uh, it's, it's not a good turnout after the wine gets introduced, <laughs> their productivity goes down again, but uh, it's, a able, it's, a, it's a way for her to distribute her product and we talk about expanding and creating relationships in the community, you know, and bringing people together because it's a real diverse project where you see people from all over to come and volunteer. It just kind of breaks down a lot of barriers where we're at and so that wine kind of eases attention and uh, <laughs> luckily we haven't been shut down by the uh, health department yet for her selling the wine there so uh, uh, it's been a real good opportunity to have her around and you know she cooks and so it's just a real real good feeling to have yeah she still she still comes she'll start coming back in the next couple of weeks or so but she still means uh she done loosened up she done loosened up <laughs> she done loosened up and so uh, i done had more than my fair share of the wine and so uh <laughs> Uh, it's pretty good wine. I should have brought some here. Uh, this is a look at the greenhouse. This is one section here. And so I have four tiers of growing. Oh, I got uh, my fish are down on the ground at six feet deep. And then I have a level, level of gravel as my first level. And what you're looking at now was three other levels of growing space. And so there is about, uh, uh, it's, I got 17 rafts on each level and 54 plant spots each uh, raft. And so it's close, I think 3,000 or so plant sites just for the rafts. And then I have the gravel underneath where we're doing some watercress underneath there. And so we feed our fish some watercress. And so uh, watercress and some uh, black soldier fly larvae, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, tilapia. So right now we have 30,000 tilapia inside of our, our tanks. The water's running through. So if you can see, there's a white pipe at the top up there. So the water gets, gets uh, pushed up there and it comes down. And it's a gravity fed. And so it goes down one tier to the other tier, other tier, other tier, and back down to the fish. So yeah, so you, you look at you know, things that don't grow as tall. So those would be more on the, the levels where it's closer to the light. Uh, you know, mainly this is primarily all lettuce here, and you have basil growing there. Uh, you probably put your Swiss chart on top, and so what's not pictured here, uh, as you can see, sort of, is another section, and that's a 120 feet long row, and that's where, like, I Swiss chart and some more basil at the top of there to give us more space to grow on top. Uh, I had a chance to go to Guangzhou, China. Uh, I actually built the greenhouse to be one of the most sustainable greenhouses in the country. So I was doing my research on anytime you grow any kind of uh, uh, fish, chickens, pigs, whatever, uh, 40 to 60% of that cost is usually feed. And so it's hard to be sustainable if you're feeding, you know, all this fishmen and all the kind of stuff. And so I went to Guangzhou, China, to the, the you know, world's largest uh, producer of black soldier fly larva. They was doing close to 20 tons of insects a day uh, in, in uh, Guangzhou, China. So I went and met with those guys there and learned how to uh, breed these things on a commercial level. Uh, they was, like I said, they was doing 5,000 grams of, uh, of eggs, and those 5,000 grams it could end up being 20,000 tons uh, in, in three weeks time period. And so they're about 40% protein, 30% fat, calcium, and it actually has an antibiotic in them that the medical industry uses for different health illnesses. And so we talk about feeding your fish something natural and healthy. This is probably one of the most healthiest things you can probably feed your fish is a black soldier fly larva. Black soldier fly larva. Uh, and so in this state, 
This stage right here, it's a, uh, uh, when they turn black, it's where they have about five to nine days before they turn into a fly. So you have a time period where you know they're gonna turn into a fly, so you need to have them somewhere contained before they turn into a fly. When they turn into a fly, they live about five to nine days as a fly. Uh, they're around in every, every state except Alaska because of the temperature. Uh, <clears throat> they don't eat food, you see them around, but they don't eat food. They mostly go to compost bins or manure. Uh, they don't carry any diseases. Uh, their only main mission is to uh, really breed and, and, and uh, die, lay eggs. That's pretty much, pretty much it as far as when they're on a the fly level. You don't want to feed them. Uh, your fish, these are the black, at the black level because they have a, a chitlin outside, the black outside to make it hard for the fish to digest. And so it's an off-white color that, uh, that produced and that's what you want to feed your, your, your fish or chickens or pigs, whatever it may be, is the off-white color of these. It's about a 45 day life cycle of the whole fly from eggs to pupae to pupae, which is the black one to fly. The odor? Well, these really don't produce, it's a, it's a different kind of odor. It's not like a smelly odor. Uh, they're able to compost uh, food and they get the food in enough times. They can compost actually about two pounds of food per square foot. And so we talk about food waste and, and taking that food waste to a value added product. So these will eat two pounds per square foot. And so when I also went to Guangzhou here, uh, I went to a hog farm. So these are the flies here. I went to a hog farm and that's one of my board members. I uh, went to a hog farm and it was set up like bowling alley lanes. It was 100,000 hogs here inside this facility. And so hogs, for those of you who know, hogs go to the bathroom about three times as much as humans. And so it was a problem in, in uh, China as well as it is like in North Carolina where there's a whole bunch of lakes and they put all that hog waste inside of there. And so they would make a slurry out of this hog waste and they would spread it down on these bowling alley lanes and they would take like a cup of these insects and they would put them like every 10 feet. Well, it usually take about six months for this hog waste or this hog manure to compost. These insects were able to compost that hog waste that would take six months into three weeks. And so they would compost this hog waste in three weeks. Not only would they eat that hog waste, but they would make a compost. And then you have a byproduct of the compost and then you have the insects. And so you're able to purge that insects from their guts by splashing them in water, hot water for maybe a couple seconds, and they'll purge their guts out and they won't have all the stuff inside of them. So it was a lot, a lot of education we learned there. And so we're trying to get into, you know, value added things as far as, you know, being sustainable. How do I make myself sustainable? Uh, another thing we're trying to do is, I was telling Catherine earlier, is I have 50,000 gallons of water. And so using aquaponics, the water self circulates. So all that water I have in there, I can take that water and since I'm growing all my vegetables pretty much on rocks or just floating on floating rafts, that's like my soil. And so if I was to take that water and add it like a fish emosia to it, then that's a value added product where sometimes you look online, it's $20 a gallon, you know, about the average. I mean, I've seen places where they sell 5,000 gallons for like $25,000. And I'm like, I got 25, I got 50,000 gallons of water. I got to get rid of this water. And that's where the fish water is worth more than the actual fish you know, as a value product. And so thinking of ways to be more sustainable and generating income. Right now, it's only like two people inside of our greenhouse working, that's me and Keisha that's working there. And so it's, it takes a lot of work to, to home in on a lot of stuff that we need to do. A lot of research and development needs to be done. And so we're currently working on uh, getting a modular system scaled and designed uh, with an architectural firm, and I'll show you in a second. So we was able to reach out, well, they reached out to us uh, HOK architectural firm, they build a lot of stadiums uh, around the world, they have a lot of interest in what we're doing. And so they came up with this modular design uh, for like an urban ag. And so we want to get into maybe like franchising urban ag where everything from the business plan, marketing plan, uh, sustainability of taking that fish water, having like an a la carte on what you want to do inside of an urban ag center to produce food. And so providing jobs, education, access to healthy food, uh, education. I mean, there's so many different things, community development that this can bring. And so we're currently working on trying to scale this model to be like, you know, a franchisable model where we can license out certain things inside of there, whether it's breeding the insects, the aquaponic piece, uh, everything that I mentioned before. <coughs> Uh, we even have plans in one of the greenhouses to do like a pond where kids can actually fish inside of there. 
And so we have a lot of kids that come inside and those are fruit trees in the back, like bananas and oranges. We have a tropical kind of setting where you can grow those kind of tropical fruits inside of a greenhouse. And so we want to make it where we have those kind of uh, things available. Uh, finished up, I heard my ticker go. So we had solar, you know, all kind of living space. We had a vent space, we're indoor, outdoor, do form the table inside of there. Uh, solar, wind, uh, overview of it, it's three greenhouses. Uh, we received an award out of 1,200 entries for those designs of uh, different architecturals around, around the country. And so we received the award for that. So my great grandmother was a sharecropper from Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, she, we talked about doing this greenhouse back in 2014. Uh, she was got sick and uh, she wasn't able to uh, make the greenhouse. Uh, she said she was sick, but even before then, she died at age 97. And so when she died at age 97, she was still going to the casino, she was still driving, <laughs> she was doing everything she wanted to do, so she lived a good life, and so it kind of hit her fast. And so uh, when she passed, that was the first year in California that they had, well, it wasn't the first year, but that was one of the years they had the drought crisis in California where they said don't grow anything. So it was the first year in almost 90 years that she didn't grow anything. So that made everything come to a complete circle. So we have to get involved in our food system because if you have a drought crisis in California, you're going to see a tomato go from a dollar tomato to four dollars tomato is going to hit everybody here because that's where most of our produce come from. And so my background isn't in farming. Uh, like I said, she was a sharecropper, and uh, when we got up to the funeral, when people talked about the good things that people do, one lady, her neighbor, got up and said, we called her former Brown because what she didn't grow, she gave to people in the community. And so when people asked what is my background, I'm just doing what she was doing, just on a larger scale, and uh, keep the legacy going. So that's my time. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>